Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack. This is Mike, Ellie, and Eric, and we're the Homebrew Radar team. So Homebrew Radar is a frequency modulated continuous wave, or FMCW radar, with a center frequency of 2.45 gigahertz. Um, a frequency modulated signal is generated using a VCO and both transmitted and received using standard gain horn antennas. Uh, the RF signal is eventually processed and visualized in real time after being converted to a digital signal using a TNC microcontroller. The radar is designed to detect and detect a human-sized target's motion, so this is both range and velocity, and output it to the user or operator in real time um, in a waterfall display format. So as I mentioned before, we're using a, a VCO or voltage controlled oscillator to create a frequency modulated signal. So our radar works based off of this FMCW technology. So by linearly increasing and decreasing the frequency that we transmit and using the physics of electromagnetic waves, we're going to get a frequency shifted and time shifted return signal which corresponds to both Doppler and, or speed and range. So going to the hardware block diagram, we start with a PIC microcontroller which generates a triangle wave. This is fed to the control signal of the VCO which generates our RF signal. This RF signal is then split evenly using a power divider and then amplified before tra being transmitted through the uh, horn antenna. Uh, it, on the receive end, it's received using the, another uh, horn antenna, amplified, mixed with that split uh, modulated signal and then pass through a low pass filter so we can bring it down to baseband and convert it to a digital signal. And all of them happen based on you see it right here and our custom made PCB. That's important. Um, so as we as you see um, we have two antenna, one for transmit another for receive. Um, the signal gonna the benefit to using a custom PCB is one is much cleaner than jumpers. Um, also, uh, it also allow me to protect the signal better um, <coughs> because when you have RF signal and a DC in the same place, um, it will likely to jam each other. So using a custom circuit board is our best way to do it. Um, as you, as Zach introduced about the buck diagram, um, we also um, characterize most of the components. So during test, if we need ever need to change or update a new plan, um, we can easily do just by changing the sequence of the connected. Um, do you want Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, software block diagram. Um, basically, once our signal gets mixed down to uh, a lower frequency, uh, which is between 0 and 25 hertz approximately, uh, the TNC microcontroller on the PCB is able to sample it. So uh, what it does is it samples at 50 kilohertz, uh, and it computes 2048 point uh, FFTs on that sampled data. Uh, after it's done computing the FFT, it sends the, uh, the output of the FFT over USB to the computer. Um, and the computer receives that, it does uh, signal processing on it, and it uh, visualizes it with a custom-made visualizer. Uh, so our range calculations are done based off of uh, this key technology of the frequency modulated signal. So as you can see, if you look at the blue triangle wave, that is it's the uh, transmitted signal, and the dotted red one would be the received signal. So it's slightly time shifted. Um, this is a time versus frequency spectrum. So the frequency will be the difference um, in the y-axis between the red and the blue one. So the blue is going to increase faster, um, or it's going to be at a higher frequency because of the time it takes for the red to be received while it's still at that frequency. So our frequency difference that is measured uh, when we mix our two signals in that mixer and then is brought down to baseband, it, we can tell by uh, linearly increasing that frequency and we'll be able to tell uh, from that mixed down signal how long that uh, it took for that signal to come back based off the frequency we're reading. And then the Doppler shift is, oh, it comes from the shift upwards. Uh -oh. 
So one of the peaks of the, the transmitted signal will either have a higher top peak or a slightly lower top peak. And you can measure the difference between those two between your up and down chirp. So the frequency difference as you're up chirping and down chirping, um, half of that difference between the two frequencies measured in that time is your Doppler frequency. And that can then be converted using the wavelength of the signal being transmitted into speed. Um, so you want to go to the, so this is the basis of our project is the radar range equation. Um, so signal to noise ratio is probably the most important part of our radar. Um, essentially as this number gets higher, the signal will stand out from the noise being collected um, or the clutter in the room, such as all these walls produce a lot of clutter. Uh, as you'll see, the radar does not operate as well in a very cluttered environment. You get a, a lot of higher returns from everything being reflected in a room. But in a much more open space, there's a lot less clutter and noise. Um, additionally, we're operating at 2.4 gigahertz. And so a lot of stuff operates at 2.4 gigahertz, which produces a lot more noise in the environment. Um, so essentially, it, this is just based off of a lot of our constants. So the power transmitted, we have to stick to a certain number. Um, so we're not radiating too much power. Um, and then it's just the gain of our antennas, which we're given. These antennas are very expensive, so we use them from the lab. And then the noise figure, and a lot of these are constants, so our wavelength. And sigma is the um, radar cross-section of the target you're detecting. So a human has approximate radar cross-section of one meter squared. And that's not necessarily just the area. It also has to do with the material that the target's made out of. Um, so we'll show you a video of a car being tracked as well. A car has a radar cross-section of approximately 100 meters squared. Yes, a car is not 100 times the size of a person, but since it's made out of metal, it transmits, or it reflects the signal at a much greater amount. Um, and one of the keys to our project that actually led to some of our downfalls is when we were doing these calculations, we did not take losses into account, but obviously there are losses everywhere. Atmospheric loss, signal processing losses is one of our biggest uh, mistakes is we were using a Hamming window to compute the FFT, which has approximately a five to six dB loss, or we'll get about a quarter of the power out of that. Um, so that is a very significant loss we did not account for when we were calculating our aim for 125 meters. Um, and then our speed data, since we're computing a 2048 point FFT, and we have a chirp time, uh, so the up chirp, the amount of time we, it takes us to get from 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz, is approximately 4.5 milliseconds. Um, we're, that's about 430 uh, samples, and we're because we're sampling at uh, 50 kilohertz. So we're taking into account about five chirps into our FFT, which makes speed calculations very difficult because you want to do it on the up and the down chirp instead of a bunch of chirps. Um, so we can go back. Um, so a couple more of our challenges. Um, integration between any types of components is always tough. Um, designing the power divider in itself was tough, but we also had to make sure that it was matched to our custom PCB at our desired frequencies and in our bandwidth. Um, we also had to strictly follow the FCC guidelines. And so from the radar range equation, you could see how both bandwidth and uh, the transmitted power have a huge role in our maximum range in SNR. And we had to, we could only transmit a maximum of one watt of power. And the ISM experimental band was 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. So we really had no choice when uh, creating these aspects of our specifications. Uh, another challenge that we faced when we were building this, um, the goal of the project was to do all the processing and visualization in real time. So uh, I found that uh, to be quite a challenge. Uh, one of the, the major hurdles that I uh, ran into was uh, running the FFT on the Teensy in real time. Um, so uh, originally, I was doing all this processing uh, in the same thread. So uh, basically, what that meant is I had to compute the entire FFT between samples. So that worked for like one kilohertz. Uh, but once we had to increase it to 50, it was just not possible. So uh, I implemented uh, something to use interrupts so that uh, the, the samples could be made while the FFT was uh, in the middle of processing. Uh, the second hurdle in the software side of things is the um, real-time visualization. Uh, I went through 
a lot of uh, graphing libraries, uh, matplotlib, vizpy, and finally PyQt graph. Uh, and I eventually landed on PyQt graph, which by the way, if you're ever going to make anything uh, with real-time visualization, highly recommend it. Um, the challenge for designing the hardware is mostly three um, directions. The first and most important is fight with your budget. Um, hardware design can be alternated like dramatically based on how much money you have. If you are super rich on your project, you can make something like a laptop. But if you really poor, um, you better just think about all, everything you do before you actually order it. Because PCB itself, especially the custom one, um, once you made it, you barely in, um, able to change it. So you better do all your design simulated, and that's the first um, challenge I meet. Um, so before beginning of this semester, we're still settling on the final plane. Um, either we are using <coughs> the a connector rice and produced by others, or we just buy the service mail and solder ourselves. And then in the end, we just think this is the cheapest way we can do it. So that's what we do. You see, like those little black one are all uh, connectorized surface mount components, and this actually saves us like a lot of money. The second challenge I see in the hardware is you putting a low frequency component with a high frequency component. You know, like DC system creating um, uneven ground. If you don't put your ground plane careful enough, the high current that returns to your ground gonna flow through your RF signal and cause your RF ground is floating above what you're supposed to be ground. So in this design, I putting I put separate ground for the RF, each RF components and the DC components, and they only meet in one place, which are connecting to the power source. And the last challenge I meet is the power. You know, like when you have a op amp, you want a positive minus power supply, but we because we want to put it into a single place, we wanted to use like a single power. So this is why we have this little power module. They convert a single rail power to a dual rail. So we can power all of our components out of like a positive minus um, power source. So another importance was being able to make sure that this radar was completely portable so that we could do testing outside and we wouldn't have to use a pow huge power supply and plug that in and we can actually go to a big open field and record some data. So our the first two videos we'll show you are actually uh, pre-recorded. Um, so the first one will be Jack and I walking in and out. Uh, we went up to Skytop and walked around in the big open parking lot so we had a lot of space. Um, so as we said earlier, we were hoping to get 125 meters, but due to our miscalculation prior, um, we ended up only getting to about uh, 70 to 80 meters for a person. Uh, car, we were able to get much further than that. Um, however, you can see us uh, walking in and out. Uh, it can detect multiple targets. Uh, the noise out here uh, comes from our fitting function. So we use a fitting function. So larger range detection, since it produces a lower amplitude of returns, um, can be viewed similarly to up close returns. Um, but as a result, the noise at very large distances, as you can see, it's about 140 to 160 meters, which we weren't even aiming for. Um, so that wasn't seen as too much of a problem for us. Additionally, there are the trees, which have a large RCS, uh, because there's a lot of them, and that returns uh, some of the noise that we can see. Uh, another thing that I think is uh, something to highlight about this uh, visualization software, um, it allows us to save runs and replay them back in real time. So that's what's allowing us to show this video at the same time that we're replaying the data. And that also allows us to tweak our signal processing algorithm and see what it would look like in the field. All right, so. Uh,
and everything's a lot better. Um, so to remove clutter, uh, all non-moving targets are removed from uh, the scene. So there are still some returns because it's very noisy and cluttered in here. But if you guys just start moving around, uh, you should be able to see yourselves. Um, because of hardware eliminations, yeah, you just get up and walk around, walk towards it, walk, come back, go away. Uh, because of hardware eliminations, this radar currently is tuning minimum range at five meters. So if you get super close to the radar right now, um, it will not be. It will have something. So in order to work inside, if we have use this massive reflector, which will reflect a much greater than a human, you can see it a lot better in the radar scope. about five meters um, uh, to work out in the field because the, it's, as we said the signal to noise ratio as it increases it gets very very large at small ranges so in order to detect that large ranges um, we needed to set a minimum distance and so as Ellie mentioned we also were able to get some data um, with driving a car away from the radar and the car having a much bigger RCS gave us a lot bigger returns. We were able to see the car a lot further than we were a person. I'm sorry, let me just pause the code change. So we didn't, we actually didn't record the car driving away with the data, but um, you can imagine a car driving away in a straight line from the radar. And you can see that there's much stronger returns and like was driving pretty fast. <laughs> you can see him get to about where the trees are at about 140 meters, which is past what our maximum range for a human-sized target was. All right, I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions? What are those before you want? These? Oh, yeah. So because it was raining every single time we tested, we had to test it out of the back of one of our cars, and you see some big returns at uh, every time instance. Um, and this is because it was actually, we didn't know what it was at first, but the, um, the gate of the trunks actually was causing some reflections, and so we, we actually figured that out by moving it, and this would change a little bit. Um, so yeah, we're getting this constant return at a very short range because of bad weather conditions that we had to force us to change the way we tested. Well, so you talk about speed. How, do I, how does this work? Um, so our speed does not really work very well, so we opted out of displaying it for you. Um, speed is much more difficult to measure than we anticipated um, for many reasons, but one of the major ones is we're, it's, this is non-coherent radar calculation, so we don't know at what time we're up chirping and down chirping. Um, additionally, we're taking the FFT across multiple chirps, I said about five. Um, so in order to get speed calculations, you want to compare an up chirp to the next down chirp, the next up chirp, um, and you check the frequency difference in the returns. Additionally, that also takes into account uh, target detection, which is another very difficult aspect of radars. Um, and we did not get around to target detection. As you can see, there's all these sorts of returns. Um, at different ranges and there will be a small, uh, is the width of the um, return, if this will come back up for us, that since we're, take, since we're taking the uh, FFT across multiple chirps, this width corresponds slightly to the speed because that frequency is shifting back and forth across multiple chirps. Um, we tried a lot of different things. I attempted to go through uh, calculations based off the width of these returns, it didn't come out very neat. Uh, okay. So we did not choose to show that. You got the good job. <laughs> but like, since you have the position and the time, can you like, right, yeah. so, can you like give a rough estimate of those? So yes, again, that would have to do with target detection though. 
um, which is a whole different hurdle that we did not attempt. <laughs> yeah, so that like that's basically the nature of a waterfall display, um, rather than like, you know, having something that would fit a function to that. Whatever our biggest returns is, where we can then find the slope, which would be the speed, and that even then it would only work for constant velocities.